I'm British astronaut Tim Peake, and I'm going to be talking about some of the most iconic moments in the history of human spaceflight for Wired. Behind each of these photos is a different story about humans in space. Missions being just seconds away from failure. We're breathing again, thanks a lot. Secret codes. And taking crazy risks, well, just because we can. I guess we should start at the beginning. The first human in space, Yuri Gagarin, strapped into his Vostok 1 capsule there. Inside that spacecraft, there is a code that is secret even to Yuri himself. Yuri didn't have any control over the spacecraft at all. It was fully automated by a computer system and mission control. Code 125 would allow manual controls, but only in case of an emergency. There was so much fear in the Soviet Union about defection that the code was hidden from the cosmonauts themselves and they were only going to be told about it in the event of an emergency. But actually several people did tell Yuri the code secretly before he flew so he knew what it would be. What you may not realise is that on the front of his helmet there he's got the letter CCCP to represent the Soviet Union. It was painted on at the very last moment. The Soviets realised this iconic moment. There was nothing to identify him as a Soviet cosmonaut. So one of the engineers grabbed his helmet and painted those letters on. That paint is still wet right there in his capsule. The launch didn't actually go completely according to plan. Yuri went into a higher orbit than was expected. They didn't bother telling him about it. There really wasn't much he could do about it anyway. And he didn't land in his spacecraft either. The Vostok ejected the cosmonauts out and they actually parachuted back down to Earth. And upon landing, Yuri was greeted by a very shocked farmer who he asked to call Moscow. Valentina Tereshkova, first female to fly into space. Actually, this was part of the space race. The Soviets had got wind of a woman in space program over in the United States, trying to see if any of the physiological differences between women and men would create an advantage for flying female astronauts into space. No surprise, they didn't just pass it. They actually performed in about the top 2% of their male counterparts. When the Soviets got wind of this program, they thought, well, we're not going to get pipped at the post. And so they went for their own selection process and subsequently flew Valentina Tereshkova as the first female in space. And the women in space program, it was just a study. In fact, it was over 20 years until the first American woman flew to space. We've got Ed White here the first American to do a spacewalk. The United States had wanted to be the first nation, but 10 weeks earlier, Alexei Leonov had gone outside of his spacecraft and, and done the first ever spacewalk. And it wasn't without risk. Leonov's spacesuit expanded so much in the vacuum of space, he had to depressurize his own suit to get back in. The United States realized that their first spacewalk better be something a little bit more impressive than just opening the hatch and poking your head out. I feel like a million dollars. Also, you may not know that on his spacewalk, he lost a glove with the hatch open to the capsule. Looks like a thermal glove, Jim. It is, it. Ah. It's happened several times since. Like when this $100,000 toolbox floated away from this NASA astronaut in 2008. Oh, great. The tool bag circled Earth over eight months before burning into a fireball and destroying itself over the Pacific Ocean. The other thing both of them realise is that there are no handrails at all on the outside of these capsules. They're floating around on umbilicals here out in space. And at one point, Ed was wiping himself over the windshield of the capsule and his crewmate inside was kind of saying, hey, you know, get, get yourself off my spacecraft possibly one of the most iconic photographs in the history of human spaceflight. If you zoom in, then you'll actually see Neil taking that photograph reflected in the gold visor of Buzz Aldrin. It nearly didn't happen, of course. Neil nearly ran out of fuel coming down to the surface. 5%. The fuel got lower than it had ever become in any of the simulations, in any of the training scenarios. 30 seconds. Bringing the lander module down to the surface, it was kicking up all this lunar dust. Picking up some dust. And, and he wasn't able to even see his landing site. Well, we're drifting to the right a little. Was the lunar landing module just going to sink several feet into lunar dust? Were the astronauts going to sink up into their knees and not be able to actually walk anywhere at all? Neil had the cool presence of mind to just continue on, not worry about the fuel. So when the landing module touched down, 
The only real way they realize they're on the surface is when the contact light came on. Contact light? And the engines were cut. Okay, engine stop. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. And you think, wow, you know, to have had such a, an incredible technical achievement, but actually still to have had so many unknowns. At some point, you have to do it. You have to be the first. And these were the first people to have experienced that. This photograph actually became known just as the poster. It adorned many bedroom walls of teenage kids and, and younger who would just stick it up and, and look at that iconic image of a human floating out there, untethered. The feeling of exposure and vulnerability in that suit. The risk was palpable. Imagine if one of those thrusters had just got stuck in the on position as he was maneuvering around. That would be it. Game over. Bruce would be off, lost forever into the cosmos. And you could arguably say, well, what was the point of that? What was the, what was the higher purpose? Perhaps there wasn't one. This was just like the jet ski of the uh, spacewalking world. Just because we can do it, let's go out there and do it and have fun. Another thing you may not realize in this photograph is he was shivering and, and freezing cold. So although the poster looks like the most serene, the most tranquil event ever for Bruce at the time, it was pretty hard work. Peggy Whitson, June the 5th, 2002. This spacewalk really just shows how far we've come now being able to perform eight hour, very complex missions outside the space station. Space went from being a very competitive race between two nations to a very collaborative period in low Earth orbit. And so having been working apart during the space race, let's build a space station together called the International Space Station as we know it today. This next photograph is Frank Rubio. One of the best things about space is playing with your food and water, frankly. And when you get a, a bubble of water uh, in front of you, it just makes you realize how different the weightless environment is. We've gone beyond the days of just building a space station. We're spending huge amounts of time now in space. We're using it as a microgravity laboratory and science that's becoming more and more valuable by the day as we realize what you can do in weightlessness. So fast forward to today and looking to the future with Artemis 2 uh, not far away now, the first crew to return to lunar orbit for over 50 years. There's a little bit of a space race starting again though because Russia isn't part of that partnership, neither is China. Other nations such as India having a very dynamic space program landing a rover on the south pole of the moon. In this new era of space exploration as we move outside of low Earth orbit once more. It's going to be a very exciting five to ten years ahead. <laughs>